everybody stand with us.
We come to you this morning. We come to you this morning, God. We come to you this morning. We want to be with you this morning. We want to see you this morning. We want to hear you this morning. And we want to serve you this morning. Thank you, God, that we can come together as a church and we can raise the praise to you, God. Thank you, God, that in this nation we can still say Jesus is Lord and we can, we can walk according to your precepts in this country. Lord, we thank you that we can pray over this nation and we know it will have impact, it will have, have power because you said the, prayer, the, righteous, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And so, God, we pray over this nation. We pray against the spirit of racism that's trying to raise its ugly head. We pray, pray against the spirit of division. We pray against a spirit of injustice. Lord God, because you're the just God, we didn't need you to tell us that you cared about justice. We know that you care about justice. We know that you care about the poor. We know that you care that people would be act impartially. We know, God, that you knit us together as one people because there's only one God and Father of all. And because we know those things, we can bless this nation and say, God, bless America because your hand is still on her, but you still want to correct the things that are broken here. We thank you, God, that your word says that out of our mouths shall not flow blessing and cursing, and so we remove the curse from our mouths over this nation. We remove the curse from our mouths over our brothers and sisters. We remove the curse from our mouths over the things that are before us and we bless and not curse. Lord, let us be those people that are willing in this nation to stand up for what's true, to stand up for what's right and righteous and call it no other agenda than the kingdom of the living God. Can anybody say amen to that? There's no other agenda but the kingdom of God and his righteousness and his son being glorified in this world. And so if we have one charge and we have one charge, it is to glorify God with everything we say, we think, we do, and we sing. That is going to be the thing that heals this nation. And anybody here praying for this nation, I hope you are. I hope you are because the pressure is coming against it from so many different places, and I believe it's spiritual warfare. I believe the spiritual warfare is so real. Now remember what Scripture says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness in high places. And so because it's a spiritual battle, we are the ones that are supposed to be waging the war against it. We are the ones that have the power of the living God in our mouths and in our hearts that should be speaking against it. We are the ones that are supposed to go out into society and show people how to walk against it. But I'll be the first one to tell you, you can't walk against it unless you're walking under the power and the unction of the living God. How many of you agree with that? See, you ain't going to speak against it unless you got the power of God and the Holy Spirit in you and the sword's coming out of your mouth and it's according to the word, not your agenda or your politics, but according to the word of God speaking into the circumstances that we see. And that will heal this nation. That will change this nation. No other banner but Jesus Christ. Can you say hallelujah? No other banner but Jesus Christ shall we stand under because he is the one that overcomes. I say all of us should be on our knees daily in this season. We don't even know what's going to happen in September, and I don't want you to be afraid of that. I want you to take hold of it. And the reason I want you to take hold of it is because any prophetic word, anything that God gives you, is to warn you and to change the course of where it's going. How many of you knew that? See, people, the prophets want to get up and say, well, this is what it's going to be. It's not going to be pretty. I don't believe them. I believe God. I believe that's a warning that says if we will bend our knees and we will begin to pray over this nation, we will have the influence necessary to turn her back from the edge of the cliff that she is headed toward right now. I do realize that's a hard word. I do realize that's not sweetness and light. But you know what? My God is still sweetness and light. Can you say amen? My Lord is still sweetness and light. And so when he guides us and directs us to pray, 
It's because we will have an impact on this nation. So instead of wondering and worrying about what's going on in the news, how about you get on your knees on a regular basis and pray for this nation? Can you say amen? And if you're, if you're concerned about racism, you got to pray about racism. You got to pray against it. And more importantly, you got to act like you ain't no racist. Can you say hallelujah? You got to act like you ain't one. See, because racism can't, can't get rid of racism. Somebody say hallelujah. It takes a spirit from God to get rid of racism, and it should be in each and every one of us. I love this church. You know why? Because over the years, it has been this multicultural thing that we didn't design. It has been people that have been willing because they love God to come together, and that has been the thing that has kept us together. Can you say amen? And it's been a multi, I mean, it's just a blend of so many different types of people. And you know what? I personally want that to continue. I personally believe that's God's stamp on this church, that anybody should be able to come here if they love Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Anybody should be able to worship here if they love Jesus, because we love Jesus. And I may have be painted chocolate, but I'll tell you what, I still love Jesus and that's who I really am. And I want to love Jesus with other people that love Jesus because together we'll look like heaven. Every kindred and nation and tongue. And I want to look like heaven even before I get there. So my challenge to all of you as you come in, when you see people come in that door, you hug them and love them. I know we can't hug each other yet. I got it. But you can still love them. Yeah, I know. Some of us can. We're still going to get the bracelets that are red, yellow, green. Did we talk about those yet? Anybody up for that? Red means stay back. Yellow means, eh, if you're the right person. Green means, I'm all in. Hallelujah. And eventually, we're going to all go green. Amen? We're going to come out of this silly thing, and we're going to say, you know what? By the power of God, he's already healing things. He's given vaccines. God's working on this thing, and he's going to bring us through it and out of it. There's no question in my mind he's doing it. But in the meantime, we're just going to respect each other. How do you feel about that? That we're just going to respect each other. If you got red on, I'm like, praise God, hallelujah. It doesn't mean you ain't got faith. It means you're trying to be faithful. Somebody say amen. But we can honor each other with that. But you know what? This is the middle of worship, so I don't want to take us too much off track. But I want you to have that heart this morning to worship God in spirit and in truth. And understand what he wants for this world, what he wants for this nation, what he wants for your life. Amen? So let's begin together as that church that's beautiful before God, worshiping together in the name of Jesus. Amen.
us up to overflowing. Lord, we just know that we can love beyond what we're able to do, that we can be more patient, more loving, more forgiving. Lord, that we can be more compassionate. God, that we can be more full of you. We know that because you love us so much. And Lord, let that love that's in us come out of us. Let your love in us come out of us. For the people in our lives that we wrestle with, God, let us not wrestle with them as if we wrestle with flesh and blood. Let us not debate and argue with them as if we're arm wrestling to see who's smarter and who's, who knows the most. Lord, let us be loving. Let us love and, and consider one another, God. Let us appreciate one another. Let us cut covenant with one another in a way where we give what the other needs. And the other gives what we need. Lord, that that is what knits the body together. It is that we have this mutual connection of love. And that love flows back and forth to one another. And because there's that love, we're surrounded by love. And we're surrounded by witnesses who believe in love. And they believe in Jesus Christ. And because we're surrounded by so many, a cloud of witnesses, we are encouraged even in a season when there's such discouragement. We're encouraged and given faith in a season when people's faith is falling away. Lord, we are encouraged when we gather, even though some people can't gather. Lord, we're encouraged because we're together, even though some can't be together. And Lord, let us have that message to the rest of the nation, to the rest of the world, to the rest of our city that healing is possible because nothing is impossible to God. God, that healing at every level is possible, that sozo is possible for each and every one of us and us as a group, as a family, as a nation, as a city, as towns. God, that that is possible through Jesus Christ. That healing is possible through Jesus Christ. That the quieting of strife and the removing of violence is possible through Jesus Christ. That God, the lifting out of poverty is possible through Jesus Christ. And that understanding is possible through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for our city first and foremost, God, that you would keep it at a place of peace. Our, our, our city has been peaceful, God. It's been loved by you. It's always been loved by you. 
Lord, this is where you healed a nation. This is where you put a message of reconciliation. You put that message, message in Cincinnati. You put it here. Lord, the place where the Underground Railroad came up through our city and touched cities like Loveland and Mason, and it touched all of our city. And God, we call on you to continue to bless us and show us the way so that that reconciliation can continue and be perfected in Christ, not outside of Christ, but in Christ. And God, we bless our city. We thank you for it. We thank you, God, that you would keep it at peace and no violence or even pestilence would pass over it in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that you would keep the numbers of COVID down in our city in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, that you would quench it, that we wouldn't worry. We would be wise, but we wouldn't worry. We wouldn't have fear over it. And because we don't have fear that we would begin to venture forth, we would come out and we would be the children of God in the nation that you called us to. And God, that boldness would come over us where we would speak to the mountain and say, be removed. And so COVID be removed in Jesus' name. Anybody willing to pray like that? To pray like, be gone, COVID, in Jesus' name. Be gone, COVID, in Jesus' name. Quench it, quiet it, and make the pestilence pass over our city in Jesus' name. Pass over our city. And then when he asks how it happened, we're going to be lifting our voices and say, Jesus made it happen. He's the only power that can cause that cloud of darkness to just be pushed away and the healing to be in this city. And Lord God, that the violence, that cloud of violence, that thing would not settle here. It would not find a home here in Jesus' name. Lord God, as cities burn, we would pray for the people in those cities because you care about those cities. You care about the people there and you don't want them to suffer. And therefore, when we pray for their salvation and the healing of violence in those cities, God, we know it's according to your will and we have confidence in that. We have confidence, God, that you don't want Chicago or Minneapolis or Portland to burn. You don't want those places to burn. You don't want it to be full of strife and violence. And so, God, we pray for those cities as well. And we thank you, God, that you would lead our leaders to a place where we have peace in this nation and not strife. Now, God, they have to agree with you. We understand that. But we already do. And so, God, we pray for that peace. We pray for that healing. We pray for that fellowship and connection, that reconciliation, that ministry of reconciliation you gave to the church. God, let us walk boldly in it. Let us understand how to dispatch it in this world, in this time, in this season, in this place. In Jesus' name, and all who agree with that prayer said, come on, give them a praise this morning. Give them a overcoming come on say hallelujah how many of you believe the gospel is about overcoming it's about overcoming it's not just about the circumstances of this world it's about overcoming but each of you are living epistles you are lively words your books being written to be read of men that's what scripture says so the inspiration of these messages is 
that we would share where we've overcome and how we've done it because that becomes a testimony to so many other people. And, you know, the beauty of this is that, you know, I can reach certain people, you can reach certain people, and the more voices that we have talking about the gospel, the more people will come to Christ. Anybody believe that? It really is that, that we would get comfortable that God has given us an overcoming circumstance in our life that we can share with other people and they can be encouraged by it. So today we're going to be receiving from a gentleman by the name of Will Stevenson. And he is a blessing if you know anything about him. He's just done so many things in his life at a young age. He's just been a passionate man of God in the business environment and also in his personal life. He and his lovely wife have done such a beautiful job in adopting some children. I mean, I, I can't say anything more about this young man because he's just such a, a powerful force for God. So just give him a, a hand as he comes up this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Go. Good? Yep. Everybody go. hear me? Yes. All right. Well, it feels good to be back at Sozo. Many of you haven't seen us in a little while, so we've been quarantining, if you can't tell, by the uh, quarantine self-haircut and quarantine beard here. But um, I feel incredibly lucky to call Sozo Loveland my home, and I feel incredibly lucky to stand up here today. Um, that being said, uh, when I was first asked to speak about overcoming, I thought, me? They got the wrong guy. What are they talking about? What have I ever overcome? So the truth is I've lived a pretty good life. Sorry, this mic's kind of pulling at me here. Um, but the truth is I've lived a pretty good life, a pretty easy life. I grew up with an awesome brother, amazing parents, loving grandparents, um, great friends. After I grew up, I went to college. Uh, I graduated and got to work with my best friends. And then I got to marry my very best friend. Uh, and then worked at successful companies and some, somehow found and adopted the three most beautiful girls in the world. So I have my faith. I have my family. I have my fitness. I have my finances. And I have my fun. So why in the world am I being asked to stand up here and talk about Overcome? So I sat down and I started reflecting and thinking, what have I overcome in my life? And what I realized is I went from being on the wrong path to being on the right path. I went from having bone tumors in my leg to having my health. I went from growing up without much extra money uh, to growing those companies that I was talking about. I went from never being able to have children to having three children. And I went from working all day and night to being able to step away and have a break. So I think the real key for me when I think about overcoming is not seeing the negative. It's not that you don't acknowledge the negative or you don't realize that it's been there, uh, but it's you don't see the valleys. You don't see the hiccups, the health hiccups or the financial hiccups or whatever, whatever it is. You don't bring it to the forefront. You realize that they've happened, you remember them, but you don't bring them to the forefront. So you see the light, you see the smiles, you see the happiness, you uh, overcome the thoughts of doubt, and you stay committed. Uh, I remember when I was younger reading a, a quote from Mother Teresa, and it kind of stuck with me. It said, I was once asked why I don't participate in anti-war demonstrations. I said, I'll never do that, but as soon as you have a pro-peace rally, I'll be there. So... The real message behind this is, again, focusing on the positive, focusing on pro-peace, not anti-war. You're not focusing on the negative, you're focusing on the positive. Even in Proverbs, it says, a joyful heart is a good medicine, but a, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. So this is going to be my overarching message for today, is uh, positivity over negativity. Think about the positive, not the negative. Um, so one more thing before I jump back 20 or 30 years. I like to start with the end in mind. How did I get here? Uh, spoil alert, it's my faith. Uh, so you don't have to stick around to the end. You can tune off now if you're watching at home. That's it. That's the whole thing summarized. But 
Um, I want to talk about the system that I've used uh, to keep me on track, especially in my adult life. So every year on my birthday in January, I set five goals for the five major pillars in my life. I call these the five Fs, and I try and make big leaps across each one every single year. The five Fs are faith, family, fitness, finance, and fun. So I've already mentioned it once earlier. That'll be the theme through the rest, but um, I'm going to walk through a few stories today and explain how they're all related. Uh, I'll start with my faith and jump back a few decades. So I don't think my faith journey is super unique. I think a lot of people have probably experienced the same thing. I started out going to church. My parents got me in church at a young age. I would go three times a week for a long period of time. Um, I grew up. I started drifting away from my faith for several years. I was on the wrong path doing the wrong thing with probably the wrong people. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was diagnosed with bone tumors in my leg. I was prescribed heavy narcotics. That's when things probably slipped the furthest away. But ultimately, I came back. And at this point, I'd say in my life, I'm more faith-filled than ever. So when I was on the wrong path, there were no specific events that pushed me back into my faith. So my question is, does this sound familiar? And you don't have to identify or raise your hand, but do you know people in your life, people in your family, or maybe it was you, that started off in church, drifted away, and then came back? I don't think it's that unique. I think a lot of people do it. So the question is, why did we return? In Genesis, it says, And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is one example, but in the scripture, it talks a lot about generational prayers um, and generational blessings. So, People doing the right thing and praying for you ultimately can save you. I must have had a lot of people doing the right thing and a lot of people praying for me. So my first message about overcoming is sometimes by no doing of your own, you're going to overcome. No matter how bad you try to mess up your life, God isn't listening to just you. You can thank your parents, your parents' parents, your aunt and uncle that you see once a year. You can think, thank your wife. In my case, I thank my wife very much for this. And the people before you are the ones that were doing right and praying for you. So the message is never stop doing right and never stop praying for those around you. The second pillar that I have is family. I'm going to uh, talk about a story that most of you are familiar with. Jess is uh, done a video on this. I've stood up here and talked about this, uh, but it's the story of my girls. So I'm going to take it back a few years prior than most of you know. Uh, when Jess and I first started dating about 12 years ago, uh, we were in our first month of our relationship, and she told me that she couldn't have kids, and she was rightfully emotional about the topic, but I just remember thinking, why is this crazy lady telling me she can't have kids when we're a month into our relationship and I'm 19? Kids aren't exactly on my, uh, on my roadmap right now. So she said, she, when she was telling me about this, she said that she thought I should know early because it was her biggest fear to not be able to give her partners kids. I could tell it was a huge source of pain for her, but again, honestly, at that time, it, it, to me, it was, it was no big deal. So I want to fast forward about a decade when we first got involved with foster care and we were going through the process to start fostering and uh, hopefully ended up adopting. We got the call about Lexi. Um, we were instantly in love as soon as we saw her. And then came the challenges. So she was born addicted to drugs. She was in the uh, NICU, which is just the infant ICU, for the first 30 days of her life. So with her being there for 30 days, we were there for 30 days. We were there for 30 days, 30 nights. Um, and can you believe that 
after those 30 days, she had the audacity to wake us up every night to tell us she was hungry. Every single night. I'm, of course, kidding about that, but in all seriousness, just to put it into perspective, what we were going through at the time is not only were we first-time parents, not only did we have a baby uh, born addicted to drugs, not only were we going through the foster care system for the first time, not only was it just a big mess, we were going through all the normal challenges of first-time parents with an infant, too. So the biological parents were in and out of the picture throughout this. We were getting pulled around in different directions. We were told that we needed to take Lexi's two sisters and threatened if we didn't. We, of course, took them in, regardless of the threat, and we instantly had three kids in six months. So the caseworkers stopped responding when we had questions of no fault of their own. They were completely overwhelmed and inundated with cases, uh, far too many cases for the number of caseworkers. The process was long and frustrating and long and frustrating. But in the end, it all came together. The one constant for me, for some reason, throughout this entire process, I was never afraid. Not once. And I, th I thought back and I started talking to Jess about this, and I don't think she knew I was going to include this, but I started talking to her and I was like, do you ever remember a time through this process when I had doubt or I was afraid or anything like that? And she's like, no, you were always confident about it. And I'm not normally like that. I'm normally, I normally have doubt and I'm afraid of things. But for some reason, throughout this entire process, I was always confident. I was walking around, I was telling people, we're going to adopt these girls in one year. And everybody, literally our caseworkers said, you're crazy. Uh, it's two or three years minimum. You're not going to do it in a year. I said, we're going to do it in a year. And everything's going to work out. And it's all great. And I never had any doubt that it was going to happen. So God gave me comfort to give to my family and my wife. Despite not knowing where we were going, despite seeing, seeming like the entire thing could fall apart at any time, God gave me the faith and ability to comfort my wife. In Hebrew it says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. The highlight of this story is God may not give you directions turn by turn like Siri does, but God is with you every single turn. He gives you what you need when you need it, and he's not going to let you not hit your destiny. God knew my wife needed someone like me 12 years ago. If you want to hear about how my wife is my rock, Stick around to the end. The third pillar is fitness. So just like my story with faith, I don't think my fitness journey is all that uncommon. Um, when you're young, you take your health for granted. As you get older and your knees start cracking when you get out of bed, you start listening a little more. So I'm going to ask you guys a series of questions. Again, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to identify. You don't have to say, that's me. Um, but I want to start by saying, how many people think of fitness as secondary in their life? I'll raise my hand. Me, for sure. I used to a lot. Maybe like ninth for me, but uh, I completely ignored it. So how many of you make decisions on what you eat purely based off taste and speed? And we all know if it tastes good and it's speedy, it's not good for us. How many of you are starting your diet on Monday? Next Monday. Next, next Monday. Who's, skipping work, who's skipped working out because they just haven't felt like it? Or because they make up some other excuse for themselves? Well, my answer to all of those is I've done it all. And I do it still to this day. But the goal is to shrink down how many times you do that, right? So I'm going to ask you a different set of questions. What if God told you to do something? Would you do it? The obvious answer is yes, right? If God told me to do something, I'd do it. Do you believe that all things are possible through Jesus Christ? The obvious answer is yes, of course. 
So, this is the part where you guys don't like me. In Corinthians, do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, God, uh, honor God with your bodies. So why are we not taking better care of ourselves? We just said that if God said it, we'd do it, right? And we just said that we believe that all things are possible through Jesus Christ, and then God told us to do it, and it's possible, so why aren't we doing it, right? So I know it's not always that simple, but I want to give my story of fitness to you guys. So in March of 2019, I weighed uh, about 205 pounds. For those of you who think I look really tall up here, I'm standing on a platform of about five, seven and a half. Don't forget the half. Uh, 205 is uh, not where I'm supposed to be. So uh, by the end of 2019, I was 155 pounds. So I lost about 50 pounds in nine months. I've always been a determined person, quote unquote determined, um, but let me tell you how God opened my eyes. A few minutes ago, I was talking to you about those three little girls, right? Well, God aligned them to be in my life, and I believe that my destiny is to be with them for a long period of time. Also in March of last year, God aligned it so it was the last day, my last day, at the company that I had been at for uh, four years, driving back and forth from Detroit, and that was my excuse, right? I didn't have time to work out. I didn't have time to eat healthy. I was busy. So God gave me the reason why I should. He gave me the three girls. He removed the reason why I couldn't. And now he said, what are you going to do about it? I knew I was going to take time off after we sold the last company, so I wasn't going to do anything, uh, or I wasn't going to have anything to do every day, so I knew I had the time. So I had my motivation. My excuses were removed. I started changing my entire diet. We started eating organic. And we started cooking at home more and eliminating sugar, all the things that are the worst, right? They're the worst. You just want ice cream at the end of the night. But then I started to put worship music on and started to run. And every day I'd run a little further and a little further and a little faster and a little faster. Um, and I'd start talking to myself when I was running. And I'd start saying, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. My body is a temple. All things are possible through Christ. And I'd be saying that as I'd be running. Pretty soon I was running seven-minute miles, down from 14-plus-minute miles that I'd started at. And it happened really fast, too, like within a month. And I started lifting weights, and the momentum was building, and it became a habit. So... This is the part of my talk when I start losing people. People start saying, well, he doesn't know what it's like to be 50 and be out of shape. He doesn't have it as bad as me. Or I worked two jobs and he had, he, he had the ability to take time off during that period and focus on it. To those people, I'd say, you're right. I don't know what those things are like, but I do know what it's like to have bone tumors. I do know what it's like when you run and every step hurts hurt your knees. I know what that's like because I have bad knees. I do know the feeling of a goal being so far away that it's absolutely unachievable. It feels so far away. I do know it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle because you feel so bad physically and mentally, you can't work out and you can't eat right. But I also know that the only thing that's going to make you feel better are the things that you're telling yourself you can't do. Hold on, I want to repeat that. I know it's a vicious cycle because you feel so bad physically, mentally, emotionally, and it's the same thing with the spirit as well, spiritually, that you can't do the thing that's going to make you feel better. That may be, it's not true, but it may be your reality that you're living in. But the truth is, the only thing that's going to make you feel better are the things that you are saying that you can't do. So I had to have a conversation with my girls not too long ago, and I've had this conversation multiple times, uh, because of their height. 
Has everybody seen my girls? They're like this tall. They're a little itty bitty, right? Um, but one day my oldest daughter came to me and she said, Daddy, I'm never going to be able to ride my bike and stand up on it. She was super sad. I knew exactly what she was talking about. All of her friends come down to the cul-de-sac. They ride their bikes around, and they all stand up on their pedals after they get going, right? And she was super upset that she couldn't, she couldn't do it. So I said, let's go outside and let's try. We went outside. Under 10 minutes, she was standing up on her, pe on her bicycle, pedaling it around. She felt a huge sense of accomplishment. Later that day, I had to move a mattress from downstairs to upstairs. We had had a sleepover, and when we have sleepovers and movie nights, I carry a mattress downstairs, put it right in the middle of the living room floor. Everybody lays on it, watches TV. Um, so we had to carry this mattress, or I had to carry this mattress from downstairs to upstairs. Again, my oldest daughter, I said, Addie, I'm going to need your help moving this mattress. She looked at me and she said, Dad, I'm too small. I'm too small. Which, from appearances, she, it's probably right. You know, you look at this big mattress and you look at this tiny little girl and you think, no way. So I sat her down and I told her this, and it's the same thing that I tell everyone. Being small doesn't mean that you can't do something. Do you know what makes you not able to do something? And Addie said, what? And I said, a small mind. And I said, do you have a small mind or a big mind? She said, a big mind. So she pushed and she pulled and she pushed and she pulled, and finally we got the mattress where it was supposed to go. She looked at me and said, well, that wasn't too bad. And that's exactly what we say to ourselves when we do something and accomplish something that we've been making excuses for. When we accomplish something and make something happen, at the end we're like, oh, that was it? That wasn't so bad. Nine times out of ten you'll say that. So... I'm here to say you don't have to run miles. You don't have to go to the gym for hours every day. You don't have to get on a bicycle and ride 30 miles. The only thing you have to do is run your own race. The race might be an extra 100 steps a day. It's not that much, right? A race might be eating less junk food. The race might be cutting out pop. Your race might be simply to start believing in yourself that you can accomplish these things. Whatever your race is, realize that God wants us to take care of ourselves. He doesn't want us living in pain and discomfort. Run your race, and it'll pay off in the end. All right, my fourth pillar is going to talk about the blessings I've received on my financial pillar. I mentioned I grew up without much extra, right? As a matter of fact, my parents and I still joke about it. My friends used to call my house the Amish house because we didn't have cable and we didn't have video games. Um, that said, I always had everything that I ever needed, for sure. And without a doubt, my parents went above and beyond. I never went to bed hungry, ever. I was never in that situation. I never needed a hug and didn't get a hug. My parents loved me unconditionally and told me that every single day. My parents are people who I aspire to be. They're patient, they're loving, they're an example of what every parent should be. That didn't stop me from running other people's races. By the time I was a teenager, I'd find myself wondering why we didn't have the extras that other people had, why we didn't have satellite TV, why we didn't fly to Disney World, why we didn't have brand new cars. I'm sure there were times that I even became jealous of my friends for those things. But those aren't the times that I remember. I remember the, the times my dad taught me how to fish. And if you ask him today, he's still teaching me how to fish. I remember the times my mom would take me on adventures. I remember building tree houses with my brother and with my friends. But the strangest thing that I remember from an early age, is I always knew I was going to be successful. God had put that into my heart. My parents were a huge part of that. They convinced me that I was smart at an early age. They taught me how to work hard. They taught me how to be kind. And more importantly than anything else, they taught me how to pray. Outside of my parents thinking I was special, which is kind of like a thing that people say nowadays anyway, 
Um, outside of my parents just thinking I was special, on the surface I had no specific skill set that made me special. By the time I was 16, my dreams of the NBA were shattered. <laughs> but God had put it in my heart that I was going to be successful. Similar to how I would tell people when we were going through the adoption process with the girls that we were going to do it in record time. When I was a kid, I would say out loud to people, imagine this, like a 10 or 12-year-old kid saying, I'm going to be successful. I talk about it just like I talk about the weather or getting a coffee today. Casual, normal, I'm going to run companies someday. I'm going to be able to buy my parents cool stuff one day. I'm going to be able to buy that dream car that I want. People literally thought I was insane. There have been many times when my wife has thought I was insane. I won't name any times, but there have been. But despite all that, I stayed focused and I believed. Again, I'm not saying that there weren't bumps along the road, or even that I don't remember the bumps. I'm just saying I don't bring them to the front of my mind. I remember when there were single digits in the bank account. But more than the time that I remember that there were single digits, I remember that my wife and I had food during those times. I remember when God gave me a promotion that I didn't deserve. I remember when God doubled my salary at 25 overnight, like that. Literally, unexpectedly, boom, like that. I remember the positive. In the book of Matthew, it says, And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Stop, back up. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive, most important part, if you have faith. The most important part is you have to believe. If you don't believe and you're just saying, like if I, I don't believe that there's going to be a million dollars that fall, right, fall down on this stage right now. If I say there's going to be a million dollars that fall down on this stage, I'm saying it, I don't believe it. You have to believe in what you're looking for and what you're asking for. You may not have a path. Your dreams might be a mountain. People are going to tell you that you're never going to get there. The good news is people aren't God. God can move mountains. Have faith and you will overcome. So my last pillar... My last pillar, the hardest one for me, fun. It's true, I'm bad at fun. My wife, my wife on the other hand, is a professional fun haver. She actually calls me a fun sucker when she's doing something and she says that I'm sucking the fun out of it. But that's nothing that God wasn't anticipating. He knew with my positives of working hard and staying focused, I'd need someone to create fun. Someone that would make me stop for a minute and enjoy life. That's my wife. Similar to how I was her rock during the foster to adoption process, she's my rock, my fun rock, every single day. That said, until I had faith, I don't think I really knew what fun was. I was looking in the wrong places for it, for sure. Um, but once I had my faith, I realized what it was. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not steal and where thieves do not break in and steal. What I believe God is saying is don't focus on growing your bank account. Don't focus on getting a bigger house or getting more money. All of those things can be supplied by God at any given time, whenever he chooses. So instead, focus on investing in the things that make God happy, which will lead you to heaven. And in heaven, those joys can never be taken away by worldly things. So here are my questions to you. What was the last good thing that you did for someone else? Again, you don't have to answer. Close your eyes and think about it for a second. What was the last good thing that you did for someone else? Then ask yourself, 
How did that make you feel? So not how did it make them feel. How did it make you feel after you did something good for someone else? The reason that we feel good after doing these things is money is money. It goes in a bank account. It goes under the mattress. It gets spent or it gets saved. But when you do things that please God, it's like you're injected with joy. There's a reason that God made us feel that way after we do a good thing. He wants us to keep doing them, right? So my wife and I started a nonprofit about a year ago called Do Good Mission, which many of you know about, many of you have participated in, and we could not be more thankful for that. So thank you again for that. But our entire goal around this was Let's raise money, services, and goods from local businesses and local people and package those up and give them to someone locally that needs a helping hand. So many of these stories that we've gotten will literally rip your heart out. It's just crazy the things that people go through. But some of the most joyous moments of my life, my entire life, have been over the last year, helping the people that needed it. So, again, you don't have to start a nonprofit. You don't have to even devote time or money to a cause. But I am a believer that if everyone reached out to the three people that needed a helping hand around them, that the world would be a much better place. So next time you see someone struggling, just ask, how can I help? That's it. How can I help? And help them. So I know I only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, but at the beginning, I spoke about the framework that I live by, the five Fs. Does anyone remember the five Fs? Faith, family, fitness, finance, fun. Yep. Did anyone pick up on the trends there? They're ordered in terms of importance. Faith is the backbone to every other pillar. Faith will bring your family together. Faith will help you lose 50 pounds. Faith will help you get that promotion. Faith will guide you to do the right things in life. So while some people have described me as determined, and I think I even described myself as determined earlier, and I may be determined in the human world, I get my determination from my faith. Here's what I mean by that. And I try not to read directly off this, but I'm going to read directly off this because I think that this is important. So people have asked me, why do you think you can go out and accomplish the crazy things that you set out and say you're going to do? Why do you think you can? If you believe in the same God that I believe in, you know that nothing is impossible. Nothing that you ask for for the right reasons in faith will be denied. Nothing will stop God from delivering you on your destiny. If you believe all of those things, why would you not believe that you can accomplish anything? So, wrapping up here, the overarching goal is see the positive and have faith. I just want to say thank you to everyone who listened to me drone on for a while. Everybody at home, I hope you didn't put me on mute. <laughs> hope you're still there. But uh, thank you again to the entire church for, for letting me get up here and, and chat. I appreciate it. Are we still here? Amen. Hallelujah. Great. Don't go anywhere yet. We have to meet your better half, too, don't we? What's that? Don't we have to meet your better half? Don't you have to yeah, introduce her? Yeah, bring her up here. Jess, come on. Why not? You guys are a unit, right? Yep. What you do, to, what you do in doing good, you do together, right? Yep. So let's give Jess a hand as well. Hey, Scott. <laughs> Couldn't do it without her. That's awesome. That's for sure. Praise God. And let's pray over them because, you know, they still got tasks and challenges ahead, just like all of us do. 
But uh, I believe as well, God is anointing them to do those challenges. He's got a mission for them, and he's going to do it. Amen? So uh, join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Will and Jess. We've just watched them grow, and just, God, you've transformed them. They've become such an example of overcoming whether it's health or whether it's family, in those areas, God, we are encouraged that you are a God of the impossible, and we've seen examples of that. So then we become witnesses of their lives and what you've been able to do with them. God, continue to bless them. Cover those kids in the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for making them big-minded and big kids of faith, that they would be beyond their physical size. They would be, they would be giants in faith. We thank you, God, for all the good things that have happened in both of their lives from their parents and their grandparents because those blessings flow down from the generations to the generations. And we thank you for bringing them here that we might, even for a, for a short time, get to know them, come to love them, get to see them, and hug them and call them friends of ours. And we bless them and we do so in Jesus' name and all who agree with that prayer said... Amen. Give them another praise report, and thank you guys. Thank you. Amen. Isn't that good? Come on, isn't that good?